Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back again to the Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us today again, uh, Jennifer Balava. Uh, Jennifer is the lead naturalist for the Burlington County Parks. And um, this is gonna be a part two. Uh, she did a similar uh, topic as part of this year's Pineland Short Course. And uh, today she's gonna speak about communication in nature. Uh, and she's gonna cover amphibians, insects, and mammals, and uh, really focus on how they communicate with each other. And uh, it should be a very interesting program. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jen. All right. Thanks, Joel. Um, so uh, C Communication in Nature series is a three-part series. And part one, as Joel mentioned, was on birds. Uh, I did that for the Pylon Shore course. So uh, this is a part two. And um, so this is going to focus on insects, amphibians, and mammals. And obviously, each one of these animal groups could have been its own separate presentation devoted just to it, uh, especially insects. There's so much to, to cover. So this instead is meant as a very broad overview of animal communication methods. In the future, I may split these out into separate uh, presentations if I find there's more interest in this topic. The animal species that uh, I'm covering in here pertain to those found in our area of New Jersey. And I, used uh, two books on insects, but mostly all um, the rest were online um, journal articles, uh, sources of information for this particular topic. So with that, I'm going to um, shut my video off so you can see the full screen of my presentation and um, we'll, get, we'll get started. So for the pro purposes of this presentation, uh, communication, is defined as an act or a condition of any part of an organism that alters the behavior of another. So we're gonna start with insects first. Obviously common among all animals uh, is the need to find a mate, defend a territory, uh, identify members of the same species, and also notify each other of um, danger. So all of these require some form of communication. Uh, so we're, first we'll start with visual cues and then we'll go into some other um, types of communication cues like sound and scent. So with insects, visual communication takes place by displaying certain body color patterns and textures. And each species has specific color patterns, which is obviously very useful for identifying members of the same species. And also to attract a mate or even to alert other organisms, for instance, if it is poisonous. So um, good examples of this would be uh, the monarch butterfly, which is very bright warning coloration when it is a caterpillar, which you see in the top right there, and the adult in orange and black. So that's warning to uh, predators that it is poisonous if, um, if eaten. And many other uh, insects use this. You can also see the milkweed bug, which also um, ingests toxic milkweed sap. So it is also bright warning coloration. And then we have the viceroy, which mimics the, the monarch. And so this is visual trickery, right? So it's mimicking the monarch that is poisonous, even though itself is not poisonous. It did not eat uh, milkweed as a caterpillar. Some insects, quite a few actually, have what we call fake eyes. So they look like they are much larger than they are. This can be used um, to startle predators and um, you can see examples of that here with various butterflies, moths, caterpillars, and the eastern-eyed click beetle is, uh, is certainly a good example of fake eyes as well. And many times, insects in some form of their life cycle are disguised as inedible things. And the very first instar of the black swallowtail caterpillar that you see here uh, often resembles bird poop. And so does the viceroy chrysalis. Um, so that's always a good 
a way to avoid being eaten. So there are various ways that insects can communicate with just uh, visual cues alone. And some um, have these crazy spikes and stinging hairs, which certainly says, okay, do not touch me. You're gonna get a lot of, a lot of cases, they can be stinging hairs. And uh, you definitely don't wanna come into contact with some of those. And then there's the one caterpillar that has all of the above defenses. It has fake eyes, it has warning coloration, and it has an immense amount of stinging spines. And that's the saddleback caterpillar, uh, which is uh, definitely uh, an incredible example that we have in New Jersey of um, an insect that is using every form of defense. <laughs> One other way that um, insects can use visual cues is actually using part of the ultraviolet spectrum. So uh, a lot of pollinators can use this ability to detect UV patterns on plants, and some can use this for communication among themselves as well. So even though we can't see it, a um, good example is with the super common non-native cabbage white butterfly, the female cabbage white has ultraviolet reflecting scales on the dorsal wing surface. So when they fly, each downstroke of the wing creates a brief flash of ultraviolet that um, males can recognize as a potential mate. Honeybees have an extremely advanced social order and advanced communication. When a worker bee finds an important resource, she performs a particular dance. And that indicates all kinds of things. It indicates to other hive workers how far away and in what direction a particular food source is. Honeybees also swarm in the spring when their hive gets too crowded. So scouts will fly off to find a new location. And when they find one, they'll also do a dance to communicate to the other members where it is. And um, so it's similar to the uh, forager dance. Uh, bumblebees, like you see up here in the top right, they live in much smaller numbers uh, than honeybees do, even though they, they have a very much smaller uh, hive and they basically don't have the advanced communication techniques that honeybees do. There is uh, actually learning involved in in with regards to social insect communication. Most forms of insect communication are certainly innate, but learning plays a major role with regards to bees um, that are signaling. They need to learn what certain, res that certain resources are worth advertising, when to do so, and even how to signal more accurately. And then receivers use the information to decide when and whether to follow those signals and what type of information to take into account. One of the best examples of visual communication among insects, I think, are the fireflies. Um, and male fireflies will flash a coded signal similar to Morse code. And it's different from the signals of male fireflies of other species. So it's unique to that particular species of firefly. If a female sees a male signal, and recognizes it as her own species, she will flash back a coded signal of her own, which is usually a little different from the males, but again, characteristic of the species. Uh, unfortunately, fireflies are declining in number due to habitat loss and insecticides, um, but um, it's still one of the best uh, nighttime phenomenon in our our area to witness, especially in uh, July. There is one genus, actually, a uh, firefly that, um, it's, it, that's native to North America, whose females use a false signal to attract males and then eat them. So those are some examples of visual cues that insects use to communicate. Sound is another one that is very important to certain species. So uh, in insects, 
their sounds are unique to an individual species. And they are innate, not learned. Uh, human hearing spans from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, that'd be 20,000 hertz. And insect hearing can certainly go way beyond human hearing, uh, at least up to 80 kilohertz in the, in the case of some crickets and grasshoppers. We would consider that ultrasonic. So entomologists that study these high-pitched sounds use electronic devices that convert those inaudible high-frequency sounds into lower frequencies that they can study. Of the 30 major insect orders, nine include some that here. The main ones in our area are Orthoptera, which the crickets, the grasshoppers, and the katydids, and then cicadas and other true bugs, and Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths, and certainly uh, flies. There is um, one um, parasitoid fly that you see here, Wormia, uh, that can hear the singing of a male cricket from over 80 yards away. One of the most sensitive hearing abilities ever documented in the animal kingdom. The female fly hears a cricket drops down on it from the sky and then leaves, basically uh, bores into it and leaves uh, its eggs in the, um, in the host, leaving the larva to, to eat the, um, the cricket host. It's, uh, it's really serious, but that, those mostly occur in the uh, Southeast of the US. So there's a lot of ways that insects can produce sound some use uh, stridulation, which is the rubbing of one body part against another. So this is what grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids do. So here's an example of, of um, a grasshopper. In grasshoppers, both male and females uh, produce sound by rubbing their legs together. The male sings first, and then um, if the female's interested, she'll reply. Timbles are another way to produce sound. These are muscular vibrations of drum-like membranes at the base of the abdomen of cicadas. The contracting of the muscles causes the membranes to buckle inward, producing this really distinctive sound. So when the muscles relax, the timbles pop back into their original position. Cicadas usually sing in the heat of the day. In addition to attracting a mate, they also use these loud noises to repel birds. The cicada song is actually painful to some birds' ears and interferes with their own communication, making it difficult for birds to hunt in groups. The male cicadas in the same brood will call together in order to increase the total volume of the noise. Um, but it turns out that even cicadas have to protect themselves from the volume of their own singing. Both male and female cicadas have a pair of really large membranes um, which function like ears. And when a male sings, the um, tendon retracts and causes the, um, the eardrum to, to retract so that it won't be damaged, its ears won't be damaged by the high-pitched sound. There are also timbal vibrations in tree hoppers, which are true bugs, and they transmit vibrations through the stem of a plant that they're sitting on. And so uh, a, a tree hopper that's sitting on the same plant can pick up those vibrations. And sometimes that's for attracting a mate and sometimes it's aimed at uh, rival males, but that can't be heard by humans. There are other ways that insects produce sound to communicate. 
for instance, the hissing of certain types of cockroaches and the interesting sounds produced when wings are vibrating. So good examples of that would be in many species of flies, mosquitoes, and bees. So the, the vibration of their wings creates a sound frequency that attracts members of the same species and actually gives them an idea of the direction in which to find one another. So chemical communication is one of the most important um, mechanisms among insects for communication. And their sense of, uh, some have a sense of smell to detect if it's a remote cue or um, picking it up by contact through the sense of taste. The, uh, there's two main groups of chemical um, cues that, that animals use to communicate. One, the one major group are pheromones, which is information carried to the same species. This is most often for mating, but also for territory marking and alarm signals. They consist of many combinations of chemicals that are produced in the glands um, that could be on various parts of their body, depending on the species. And they can travel through water or air. The other group of chemical cues that uh, animals use for communication are allelochemicals. And those are signals that travel from one individual to a member of a different species. So these include things like um, defensive chemical signals, such as repellents that deter predators, and also compounds used to locate suitable host plants or host animals. So we'll look at examples of all of these now. Moths, male moths use chemical cues, in other words, pheromones, to find females. And females secrete the pheromones from glands near the, the tip of, of the abdomen. They re release those into the air, which can be detected by the males. That unbelievable, like miles away with these sensory organs on their antenna. A male moss antenna can have 150,000 scent receptor cells. In closely related species, female moths release pheromones at different times of the day to avoid confusion among closely related species of silkworm moths. So once she's mated, the female will stop producing pheromones, um, but that is the way that um, many moths communicate and find one another and certainly find mates. And uh, that is an example with a luna moth. Ants walk in a line one after another because they leave a chemical pheromone track that the rest of the individuals can follow. And that comes from glands near the, um, the uh, abdomen. And basically um, the scout that discovers the food lays the trail first and then other ants follow and reinforce the scent on the way back. As the food supply gets smaller, less scent is left. And so then when the food is gone, the last ant leaves no scent track. If an attack occurs on an ant nest, the guard ants release an alarm pheromone and the ants nearest to the nest rush to defend it. Um, and they may even need um, to release an additional scent if more help is needed. Aside from releasing those chemical signals, ant species also use their antenna and sense of touch to establish individual identities and their job within the, the colony. Ants are able to recognize their nest mates by the taste and smell found on the surface of their cuticle. The pheromone released by a queen honeybee is strong enough to attract males hundreds of yards away. Pheromones secreted by the larval honeybees will assemble workers to feed them. And pheromones are also used to elicit a swarm response, again, when the hive gets too crowded in the spring. And anyone who's been stung by a wasp knows that they don't just get stung once. They get stung many times, and often the entire group of wasps comes. That's because 
the wasp deposits a pheromone on its enemy with its sting, which identifies the enemy to other members of the hive and cause them to attack as well. So this is scent marking on the enemy. Those are all examples of pheromone uh, chemical cues used for communication. So uh, these are some examples of allele chemicals. So um, one good example um, here is an, an order that's released so that a parasite or a parasitoid can find its host. And um, certainly, see, this is an example with the Catalpa sphinx moth. And so parasitoids like the, these um, wasps that you see in the central picture detect its host by the way it smells. So the, uh, the caterpillars are feeding on the catalpa and they not only release a particular scent, but so does the plant. And that, uh, that chemical cue allows the parasitic wasp to find its host and lay its eggs inside the caterpillars. Uh, what you're seeing in the pictures are the uh, wasp pupa that have now developed on the, uh, on the host. There are lots of other examples. Uh, ladybugs send out a chemical signal that uh, makes the, the beetles come together in large groups to hibernate for winter. And um, bark beetles also use an assembly pheromone to, um, to summon other beetles. Uh, when a certain uh, good tree is found for overwintering. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that, that, that insects use chemicals to communicate. So now we're gonna move on to amphibians. And the most obvious form of communications, I guess for, for us as humans that we notice are, are their calls. So frogs and toads use mainly these vocal sounds to communicate and they are innate and passed down in their genes to offspring. The, they use different calls for different situations just like birds do. Males use uh, calls to attract a mate and also to defend the territory from rival males. Once a female frog has arrived in a general vicinity of a breeding site, she then must have, has to identify and orient towards a particular male. Usually territorial calls of frogs and toads are low groans and sound different from mating calls. Alarm calls are a noise that is made by a frog or toad that's been startled or disturbed. The frog usually makes a short squeak or squawk as it jumps away, and that can let other frogs know there's danger nearby. I'm sure we've all experienced that, particularly with green frogs and that little high-pitched scream they make as they jump away. It's very equivalent to what humans would make when they've been surprised. Sometimes there's even um, distress calls that are high screams made by uh, a frog or toad that's being attacked by a predator. Uh, sometimes it's enough to startle the predator and allow it to escape. Uh, <clears throat> and that, that's usually uh, a much, much more severe sound than just this squawk. Some uh, frogs like spring peepers are ventriloquists and they actually throw their voices so it sounds like they are somewhere else to non-spring peepers like us it sounds to us like they're in the trees they're actually down um, in the ponds and they can be deafening they have certainly been very loud this particular March and April they sound uh, like this very high pitched trails Some frogs can actually adjust to a higher pitch to be heard over traffic noise. There's very little geographic variation amongst the calls um, of, of frogs and toads, not anywhere near as uh, very much variation as there is in birds. What's important here is that if you have too many frogs calling at once, you have something called acoustic interference. And that's why the hearing of a particular species has a response narrowly tuned to the frequency of its call, its own species call. 
the frequency bandwidth available to each species will obviously decrease as more species are added. So uh, certainly vocal calls are our frogs and toads main ways of communicating in our area. There are, have been recent studies that showed evidence of visual and chemical cues used in communication among frog species in tropical areas that are active during the day in very noisy rainforests. But there are no published studies of adult frogs and toads using chemical cues in North America. There are, however, a couple studies on North American larval amphibians, meaning tadpoles, including gray tree frog and pine barrens tree frog tadpoles that respond to predator cues in the water using pheromones. These, this is just the, um, the order in which frog and toads call in New Jersey, starting with bird frogs, followed by chorus frogs and spring peepers in March, and then uh, all these other species continue after that. So as I said, there's no chemical scent cues used among adult and frogs and toads in North America, but there are some uh, tadpoles that use pheromones uh, in the water to detect, mostly to detect predators and identify what predators they are based on the uh, pheromones released. So salamanders are our other group of amphibians and they, unlike frogs and toads, are not vocal. So instead, they do use um, touch and chemical sense pheromones to communicate. The skin glands release chemical signals that function for courtship and mate attraction. Males locate and recognize suitable mating partners via pheromones that are produced by the female. Males have specialized glands that develop on the chin during the breeding season. After potential mates have already been identified, these courtship pheromones are rubbed near the nose of the female and absorbed through the skin. Males of some salamander species like this red-backed salamander have additional glands on their tail that they press onto the ground to scent mark their territory. And to avoid predators, some salamander species can release bad tasting substances from their skin as well. Some advertise their poisonous nature with these bright colors. Just a great example of that is the ref, the red eft stage of the red spotted newt. So that is an overview of amphibian communication. So now we'll move on to mammal communication. So first, visual cues. Just like we use body language uh, to, to indicate various kinds of information, mammals do so as well. Um, certainly bristling hair, bared teeth, and laid back ears is a universal sign of warning, exposing their belly or throat or their tail being tucked between the legs, which we all know in the case of dogs, signals submission. White-tailed deer have uh, very um, sophisticated visual cues. If a deer is mildly disturbed, it, it definitely stamps its front feet. And um, then after that, the deer can use a combination of stamping and snorting. And, uh, and if that's not enough, then they may do like a short whistle as just before they, they flee. But every time that uplifted bright white tail while running is the ultimate warning to other members of their deer herd that there is danger. Within a deer herd, the most aggressive males are dominant and males display five intimidation postures in increasing levels of aggressiveness. The first and mildest is the eardrop. That's when the dominant male um, will basically just drop its ears along its neck. And if that's not enough to send the other deer away, then the dominant buck will display a hard look. The head and neck you can see are extended and the ears remain flattened. 
if the adversary responds with its own hard look, then the first buck responds with a sidle. So if that is still not enough, that brings on step four, which is the antler threat. And the dominant buck drops his head and presents its antlers. And if the adversary still holds its ground and responds with and responds with its own antler threat, then the final uh, behavior is the is the rush. And of course, most the um, the deer will make uh, violent contact with their antlers until one eventually gives up. Female deer can also establish a pecking order and display aggressive behavior. Does use the eardrop, hard look, and sidle body language as well. If they need to go one step further, then the dominant doe will lunge at the adversary and as a last resort, stand on her hind legs and uh, lash out with the front feet. So those are some different uh, ways that mammals use visual cues and body language. There are some very important sound cues that mammals use to communicate and Echolocation is a very, uh, very important one. The active use of sonar along with special features and adaptations allow bats to basically see with sound. Most bats use, uh, produce the echolocation sounds by contracting their voice box that makes uh, a clicking sound. And echolocation calls are ultrasonic to us. So basically they range in frequency from 20 to 200 kilohertz, way above the range of human hearing. Although low frequency sound travels further than high frequency sound, calls at higher frequencies give bats more detailed information. And so they use those sounds much more often. For bats to listen to the echoes of their own original emissions and not be temporarily deafened, the middle ear will contract to separate the three bones um, within the inner ear and reduce the hearing sensitivity again, so they are not deafened. It turns out the sounds that, and the ways that which bats communicate using them varies tremendously for all the different ways that, um, that birds use too, mating, territory, alarm calls, binding one another, and not only from species to species, but also from individual to individual. So um, for instance, males have different calls for attracting a mate and um, warning others of danger and females have different sounds. And in very large um, colonies where there's um, many uh, bats, for instance, in a cave, the mother bats will be able to find and identify their young by their specific sound. Females communicating with one another will also sound different than when they're communicating with a male bat. Squirrels use sounds to communicate with each other, particularly during mating season and when caring for their young, and also to alert each other when there's a predator nearby. They can use teeth, uh, tooth chattering as an aggressive signal to warn other squirrels who are approaching on the territory. And I'm sure we've all heard this sound that gray squirrels make uh, when there is uh, some type of danger nearby. Um, and also chipmunks, they use a series of high-pitched chip notes that sound quite similar to the chirping of birds, but they repeat and can last quite a lot longer than a lot of bird calls. To respond to danger on the ground, chipmunks will use a deeper sound or trill that's much shorter than the, their uh, chipping sounds, and that those certainly warn other chipmunks to be more alert. Um, so squirrels and chipmunks can also, as, as I mentioned in part one, eavesdrop on bird alarm calls and vice versa. So they, they can help each other look out for similar dangers like hawks. And I did want to mention that uh, most rodents, mice and rats can also hear uh, and emit calls way above the human range of hearing. So um, 22 kilohertz, for instance, elicits a freezing behavior when they're responding to fear. 
and a sound at 50 kilohertz um, is more is related to a positive social behavior and reward processing in the brain. The mammals that have been documented um, to actually learn their vocal sounds are, are, are among mammals are whales, dolphins, seals, elephants, and bats. By far though, the most common way that most mammals communicate is by a chemical scent. And uh, certainly lots of mammals mark their territory with pheromones. These could be fluids produced from special glands that could be on their head, their chin, or even their tail in the case of a beaver. Uh, certainly urine is most often used by many mammals for indicating territorial boundaries. Uh, and, and also mammal feces have also served uh, a similar role. They're usually um, deposited to show the individual or family's range. Uh, often we'll see them in, in small amounts in prominent places, particularly at trail junctions, which we see a lot in our, in our park systems. If you come to a trail intersection, there tends to be uh, some type of um, mammal feces in that, in that spot, which marks their their uh, junction of their, their territory as well. So in addition to using it for territory, um, certainly mammals will use it, this particular uh, sense pheromones to find one another. And the um, urine is most often used by female dogs, weasels, and, and so forth as a trail for males to follow to find them for mating purposes. Some animals mark their mates uh, with urine as a warning to other males to keep a distance, as with squirrels, rabbits, and, and fox. And skunks, um, they, we, we know they use their spray as a defense against predators, but that is not used to communicate with other skunks. It's not a pheromone uh, chemical. So in conclusion, uh, we, we talked about how animals use both all visual sound and various scent cues to communicate. Insects use all three kinds of cues. Amphibians use basically mostly sound and, and scent in the case of salamanders. And mammals use all three kinds of cues with uh, scent being the most common. Sound cues have to be highly tuned to specific frequencies in order for the species to communicate uh, properly. And scent cues, again, are the most prevalent among the insects and mammals. Those, those pheromones allow private communication channels within a species. And that's very important to understanding how they can detect one another and not, the, the signals aren't crossed with other members of different species. It's their own private communication channel. It's only, it only works within a species. So it's, it's very effective means of communication, which can occur in the dark, underwater, just about anywhere. So I hope that this particular overview gives you an idea of the different ways that animals communicate with one another. Again, just meant as a broad overview, but it's, it's a really fascinating topic. And, um, and I hope it inspires you to take a closer look at how animals communicate with one another. And uh, I think, I think um, th actually the next one that I'm presenting part three is going to be presented here um, on June 9th, which is on plant communication. So hopefully you can join me for that as well. So um, if you have any uh, questions, we can uh, turn it over to you now. And uh, please remember to mute your computer if you're calling in. So we can avoid all that uh, extra echoing. Thanks for watching. Awesome, Jen, thank you very much. That was really cool to see all those different techniques, the different animals use. Uh, there's just so much going on in the woods around us. That was uh, a really uh, you know, nice view into all those things that are happening uh, that we, we, we don't know about or, or take for granted. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Pretty cool. I uh, unfortunately had the um, 
bad luck one day to run into a buck moth caterpillar while oh. walk, walking down a survey line. Um, and uh, it scarred me for about, I don't know, four, four to six weeks. I had a mark on my elbow where uh, it landed. And um, without thinking, I flicked it with my finger. And all that did was uh, put the spikes right into my elbow. Oh. I know there was a few people watching live, so we'll uh, we'll hold for some questions if some folks are out there. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's as you know, it's really neat to keep all those things in mind as you're you know walking down a trail or through the woods all the sounds the birds uh the, the crickets everything you know it, everything has a role everything's uh communicating and interacting with each other yeah yeah i i think it's it's just amazing the more you know the more we learn and the more we we really take the time to um note all these things it just it really expands our i hopefully our appreciation for just how complex nature is yeah, particularly, I'm really interested in uh, the interaction between the different plants and different animals, how they communicate, as you showed, and with each mm -hmm. other and are able to find where to yeah. pollinate. And uh, it's really a, just a neat way to uh, perceive the world around us. Yeah, for sure. All right. Okay. All right. Well, it uh, looks like maybe we're not going to have any callers today, but that's okay. Uh, as uh, Jen, I forget, what date did you say the part three is going to be? Yes, uh, June 9th for communication in nature part three on plants. That's okay. uh, June 9th. All right. And uh, next month, we're going to try something a little different. We're going to have a musical uh, program, and, and that's going to be on uh, May 20th uh, in the afternoon. And we may try to do that both live and streaming. So we'll announce that as uh, we move further on. Uh, closer towards the end of the month. All right, well, thanks, Jen, very much. Uh, with that, I'm going to end the live stream.